Hi, everybody. This is Pasha Marlowe, and welcome back to the Neuroqueering Podcast. I'm here today with Patrick Dodson. Patrick is an author and a TED Talk speaker, as well as a researcher and philosopher. His interest in the subject of identity led him to read a, uh, write a book called The Identity Project. And I'm excited to talk with you, Patrick, today about uh, your past projects and your current projects related to identity. Um, but first, uh, tell us something about your your character and core values so we can get to know you, something that would help us get to know Patrick before our conversation. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I, I props to you for creating a podcast in this field. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. So, yeah, a little bit about me. I uh, grew up in California. My great grandmother's First Nation Creek and my other great grandmother was a gold digger in Northern California. So <laughs> real contrasts of um, family backgrounds and histories and uh, eth ethnographies kind of being developed through our family life. I, um, I love cooking. I have a cookbook as well called The Kitchen Sink. Um, food's always been a, an important thing to me. And um, and my current research right now is around um, mood and food interactions and um, what that means for personal agency. And I guess in terms of your question, for me, the character trait there is advocacy. I really um, want to advocate for or advocate for people's sense of agency uh, in the world, whether that's how they interact with food or the public in general or their neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. I appreciated in your in your TED talk how you explained uh, through the storytelling, weaving in all different identities. And as a multi passionate person myself, um, I just appreciated how you celebrated that aspect of us, where we um, can evolve and enjoy many different career paths as well as lifestyle paths. Um, and that it's a constant evolution. And I just, I, I really enjoyed that about your TED Talk. Yeah, and I, a lot of that was affirmed by another TED Talk by a woman named Emily Wapnick, who called us multi-potentialites. How we, mm -hmm. you know, my my basis these, basic thesis is that, you know, you can have strength finders and Enneagram and uh, Myers-Briggs and all these different ways of identifying personality types. And those are usually kind of career driven. They're like, what career should you choose, which is sort of like taking the diversity of you and narrowing it down to, you know, an administrative role of some kind. Yes. And I think the opposite is true, that diversity in our identity really opens up the ability to take multiple different aspects of ourselves and create many things with that. Some of them where they're joining a few things together, some of them where they could just be passion projects. But it's really the story that unfolds from that um, multiple uh, understanding or ways of approaching identity. But what Emily Wapnip does is she she sort of says, you can take that and see yourself as a multi multi potential light mm -hmm. as a person rather than a career focus. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really kind of wonderful way of expanding the way of looking at your future. Absolutely. Because in the in the business world, we're constantly told to, you know, niche down and and pick something and find an ideal client. And as somebody like me who's neurodivergent with ADHD, I I rather prefer the variety and the expansiveness and the freedom to kind of move where my body wants to move and move where my mind takes me. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I multi-potentialite I hadn't heard, but I like that term. Well, and I think it, what you just mentioned uh, from the business perspective is kind of a throwback from the Industrial Revolution, where you're really um, trying to be brought into, say, a factory setting where you're just doing one task. And that was good for the people making the shoes. But mm -hmm. it, I mean, say, selling the shoes, but it wasn't good for the people making the shoes, that right. their lives were that narrowed down. And I think this is true um, in the field of neurodiversity as well, that where this sense of normative and what is normative to be normal really doesn't serve individual thriving or well-being or growth. It really serves uh, a medical industry that really doesn't know how to treat diversity or workplace environments that would rather have you focus on your task rather than come up with great new ideas. And you know, maybe as society, we're slowly shifting towards this broader understanding of diversity and the power of it. But right now, you kind of get slammed for being diverse. Right. 
Right. I look at the um, pathology paradigm versus the neurodiversity paradigm, you know, pathology paradigm saying there's, you know, one normal, one right brain, whereas the neurodiversity paradigm is saying, okay, what are we going to do with, with this, with these people where in society, they're not accommodated for, and they're misunderstood. And how could we, uh, how could we make some changes in society uh, to help accommodate uh, these yeah. differences? I mean, one good example of that is helicopter parenting, where, for instance, let's say the end goal is to get your child into a certain school. You are focusing on very normative approaches to intelligences, to skill sets that you need, experiences that you should have to get to that one point. And you mm -hmm. imagine that poor child who is starting to flourish and unfold as an individual and in their diversity, then gets put into this, well, this is the school and therefore this is the job and therefore this is the financial outcome. That pruning of all those, you know, synapses that could have been developing in other ways are really getting, you know, grooved into certain ruts at a very young age. So even before the pathologizing that you just mentioned gets taken in place at the in the medical world, the family world is starting that that kind of, you know, pruning of uh, of your own diversity. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. My my, my greatest success is, I think. Um, letting my kids, my, my oldest son in particular, uh, who, who became a car designer, um, mm. just loved playing with cars when he was little. And then he loved drawing cars when he was in high school. And one day he said, I want to be a car designer. And this is kind of like a kid saying, I want to be an astronaut, or I want to be a Lego designer. Like, you know, my, 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 uh, conditioned brain said, oh dear, okay, not many people actually get to do that. What's the plan B? You know, maybe we can go to a school that has both. Uh, mm -hmm. But fortunately, I did not do that. And I just said, why not you? Why not you? And, uh, and he flew, he just went off and just followed his, followed his bliss and <laughs> uh, calls me often and says, I can't believe I get paid to do something I would do for free for fun every day. That's wonderful. In a similar way, my uh, oldest son is a game designer. And when oh. he was four years old, he would break down SimCity to the family in minute details. And back then, you know, you're looking at what exists at, as Asperger's as characteristics, you know, being professorial or hyper-focused and not having a social cue or whatever. And, you know, these things were kind of true of him, but his ability to really understand that world and to then develop it into you know board games that he would make and eventually at 15 or 16 he went on to work in the game industry in the west coast um in washington there and then he came back to new zealand and been a game designer ever since and he's very good at what he does because of that kind of ability to use his brain and his mind in the way that really was natural for him. And at the end of the day, he's a storyteller. And mm -hmm. the storytelling can go to code, it can go to art, and can go to a number of different ways. But had I back then thought, no, you know, games are kind of a waste of time. And, exactly. and uh, maybe you're a little bit on this spectrum. And so maybe we need to attend to that instead. Um, he could have really been, you know, cut off from that path. Yeah. One of the beautiful aspects of uh, people on the spectrum is that they create, the, they have these special interests and they change and they change mm -hmm. all the time. But if you can catch a child's special interest um, and then, and then expand upon it and give them all the tools they need to, to fully enjoy it and delve into it, that could really like in your case and mine become, become their path to uh, feeling a sense of belonging in the world and thriving uh, successfully as a, as a business person and making, being financially independent from something that seemed to be just a, a hobby or a play thing. It's really yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. And perhaps that's a really interesting place to start with, you know, neurodivergence is that term on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on the spectrum yourself and you appreciate that and you're, for instance, Temple Grandin looking at cattle movements around, you know, the yard, um, that's a very natural space to uh, to locate yourself and say, yes, this is where I am at on the spectrum. If you think of yourself as neural normative and you think of on the spectrum, you automatically start to lean towards the pathologizing of it. And right. even if you love your child or your friend very dearly, there's this mindset that starts to think, how do we treat this or how do we care for this? And exactly. maybe success in society or communities in general can be where we re- 
constitute what on the spectrum actually means from mm -hmm. an appreciation that we are all mm -hmm. on a spectrum of neural diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and that if we start with that language and we see diversity in our children or our friends or um, even sometimes international uh, players, like I think of Elon Musk, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and people would consider him as on the spectrum from a pathology point of view and therefore criticize him or or maybe even not understand what he's doing because of his, that particular diversity. And if instead we can reconstitute what that means, maybe that re-evaluation um, and, and maybe the reprogramming in ourselves, especially those of us who consider ourselves as neuronormative, um, that that opens up a different conversation with those children, with those friends, and we take on the spectrum and turn it into a positive frame. Yes. Yeah. And rather than neuronormative, I, I, I use the word neurotypical because normative has a, um, like a, a privileged, uh, this is better. This is the normal brain. And I also see the human diversity, uh, or sorry, the, the humans as neurodiverse, the whole spectrum of neurodiversity. Mm. Um, but I see folks with innate neurodivergence, such as autism, ADHD, um, epilepsy, trauma, brain injuries, uh, as neurodivergent, uh, and, but not as a pathology as, as just a difference. Yeah, I agree. And I, and when I use the word normative, I do it, it is a slightly pejorative sense for myself, because I don't think there is any such thing as a neural normative or a normative person. There are normative social behaviors and normative yeah. expectations, mm -hmm. but they're not helpful in this conversation. And uh, right. I think divergence and diversity, not divergence, mm -hmm. diversity is really the helpful conversation. Um, we were having this conversation prior to recording that in the medical world, and I think largely to take complex things and try to make them simple. I don't think there's a lot of evil intent in this way, but you know, these guys have limited resources and understandings and uh, research behind them. And they'll take an issue that's very complex and they'll try to boil it down to some simple thing. Cause our brains do that. Com mm -hmm. Complex things get laddered down to seven or eight, you know, constructs that we can work with. So it makes sense that you would take something and either pathologize it or try to consider what's normative and what's not. And then to a, a approach it from a prescriptive point of view, like we need to fix this problem. Here's the prescription. And what I'm appreciating in the diversity space is the description of lived experience, the description of diversity, the description of difference and, and uh, humanity in this wonderful spectrum of understanding. And when we lean, when we go from prescriptive to descriptive, I think we we move away from that oversimplification that our brains need to deal with complex problems with and into that kind of Buddhist radical acceptance space that goes, you know, I really don't understand so much. Right. But if I can lean into descriptive understandings of things, um, and this is, I guess, where my love for identity comes in, you know, mm -hmm. raising my four children and working with thousands of young people around the world and and my um, workshops and stuff like that, you just keep seeing the diversity unfold in front of you so much that identity really doesn't need to get boiled down to an Enneagram number or a Myers-Briggs, you know, four letter code. It right. really just needs to keep going broader and broader yeah. and broader. And that is the wonder of it. And, and also the challenge of it. It's difficult then to, you know, write a job description for a business task right. or to write a curriculum for a class of 40 very di different kid, you know, children. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. becomes hugely challenging, but in a sense, maybe it's that challenge that might move those curriculums and job descriptions. And even, you know, I think we should throw the DSM out, but even the, the, <laughs> the ability to, to um, form diagnoses or diagnose diagnostic tools mm -hmm. that appreciate this growing sense of difference and you know, not just taking the biomedical model of say how the gut biome might actually be a for informing um, mental stress in some way. You know, those mm -hmm. are very helpful understandings to have, but the whole a way to diagnose, maybe even that term alone, because I was just thinking when you have children that are diverse, you don't want to take a diagnostic towards that. You want to take a, an appreciative descriptive right. approach to it. But even these more formal environments where 
Mm -hmm. uh, pain or suffering is presenting itself. Mm -hmm. How can we take that same understanding of descriptive under uh, descriptive knowings and apply them into clinical situations where somebody really is in stress or duress and needs help in some way, but doesn't need to be put into a box in that other yeah. way. So I think there's some real challenges in that space. Yeah, seeing things more uh, systemically is is a challenge, and and yet so important. In in my mental health uh, pro profession, we would see things uh, as a system and see patterns, and there wasn't one identified patient or client, uh, which was unique in the way that I was trained. And I'm so appreciative of that in the marriage and family therapy work because uh, traditionally it's this 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 one person this person is abnormal this person is broken uh this person is the client uh so but when you look at the whole system not just the family but the community and the schools and the institutions and society at large uh then all of a sudden it's it, that person is not the the one to be diagnosed it's the, it's the whole system uh that needs you know re reframing and revamping um but yeah. i want to hear about your identity work uh what does identity mean to you? Yeah, um, you know, this is a question that has challenged philosophers forever. Um, you know, do we have a soul? Can our identity be expressed? Is it fixed at birth uh, or, or is it constantly changing? You know, nature and nurture, there's a lot of uh, questions in, in this space. My understanding of it is basically uh, that there is a, a broad spectrum that we have of intelligences, of personality traits, of DNA of lived experience. Um, and this broad spectrum could be visualized like I like doing mind maps of identity to sort of say, well, tell me about your familial self. Tell me about your food self. Tell me mm -hmm. about your adventurous self. Tell me about your intellectual self. Tell me about your relational self. And it just kind of keeps going out further and further. Mine looks like a mad, mad scientist sort of <laughs> you know, map, it just, it's just probably maybe about 300 things on it. Yeah. And, and that could probably be taken deeper because you could take any one of those things like creativity, you know, everybody is creative. It's just a matter of how they're creative. And if you ask the question, are you creative? Most people would just, you know, go on normative sort of things. Am I an artist or not or a photographer or not? Right. But if you said, how do you make things and create things that are unique to yourself? And you just keep tunneling down. I think it's like a mycelium, you know, it would just sort of branch out into this real diverse sense of self and self as this multi-potential light, multifaceted person. I think Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, Strength Finders, all these different things can be useful in growing that understanding, but only if you take them as a whole, not as a particular thing or with a particular outcome, because then you're not writing your own story or you're uh, being told, you know, how you can get a job with this particular thing. And so if I start with that basic sense of diversity as identity, I start to validate or appreciate things about myself that aren't necessarily validated in, in uh, society, maybe as a job outcome or as a right. relational strength, but instead as a sense of self. Yes. And I think that's probably one of the most uh, important aspects to me of identity is starting with diversity go as broad and as wide as you can to understand the diversity of you because you are a complex, multifaceted person. And then to celebrate that, because mm -hmm. if you can celebrate that, what tends to happen is agency moves away from outcomes of identity in the world into the sense of self and self-awareness and maybe compassion and, um, and an appreciation of that diversity, my mm -hmm. diverse intelligences. So for instance, I know for me, I like um, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence. I do too. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to think of my particular spatial intelligences or how I'm not really good with math, but I'm very good with um, other aspects of language or interpersonal and intrapersonal yes. intelligences. And, you know, you could take any one of those and span out even further, but just mm -hmm. having that general appreciation of that on one side and maybe some stuff on the relational side on the other, and maybe the food or why food's so important to me um, is another aspect. It starts to give me a lot of Play-Doh to work with. You know, I can really start to make, mm -hmm. I, I'd rather have Play-Doh than Lego in this sense, you know, because yes, a little more yeah. malleable. More flexible. <laughs> yeah, a little more malleable. Uh, mixing colors, you know, forming a new color, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, 
cool. I like that kind of sense because it gives me a sense of self in the world and it locates me as me rather than me in relation or reference to other ways yes. of being in the world. And what is your favorite personal tool to get to this place of self-acceptance, self-compassion, radical self-love? Yeah, to me, this is where family and friends come in. It's very difficult. And in fact, I think it needs a particular kind of intelligence to do this for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we could with maybe an app or a tool set or a mind mapping program. But I think we need somebody to to ask us to draw it out of us. And I think that's Mm -hmm. where friends and counselors and coaches Mm -hmm. and people can really start to benefit the diversity of people. And I, when I look at the life coaching or counseling fields in particular, or even psychology or clinical psychology, it does tend to want to categorize because mm-hmm. that does simplify the process. Um, not cool. Better to go the other way and go, how can we, how can we help you express the diversity of you? Mm-hmm. And what tool sets do I need to do that? So for instance, when I do this with people, I will interview them. And I will, I will basically have a mind map on one side so that both of us can see that if we're doing Zoom or in person. And we'll just start asking questions about, you know, tell me some of your favorite memories in your childhood. And, you know, some negative things might come out and we could put a red line around those. But typically it'll just be like, how do you play? How did you enjoy life? What, when you learned, what did you love learning and why did you love learning that? And how did you learn that? Or your relational self. And I just ask questions about this. And when people have the permission. And I found this first with my children, which is where this developed um, because I didn't send them to school. I homeschooled them and, you know, not with a religious perspective rather, but to give them a lot of space to Mm -hmm. develop as different people. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, you know, we did a lot of socialization things like getting out to sports teams and screenwriters workshops and, you know, all these different things that they would do uh, really quite young compared to the rest of the people in the workshops. To, to express themselves. But what I found is that that diversity needed some space to unfold and, and they needed to be able to play and develop in a way that that could unfold. So mm-hmm. I try to take those same constructs into interviews with other people. Yeah. And I think anybody could do this. I have a website I could send you a link to that uh, is a work online workshop that friends can go through with friends. Mm, it's totally nice. free. There's a lot of information there. Great. It basically just creates some good questions of sharing life stories or key life events or moments yes. where you felt like you were most yourself and and then unpacking those moments and yes. what was being you, what did that look like in detail? Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So we start to get that diversity, you map it out and you see it in words, maybe in pictures for some people, however they best express themselves. You start to get that sense of self, which then I think automatically starts to kick in compassion because I think maybe the opposite to compassion is comparison. You know, where I'm mm-hmm. referencing myself from the outside, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be very compassionate because the it's a it's a fixed game already. Yes. Whereas if I'm looking at more and more of myself, hopefully with a good friend or family member that celebrates these things with you, then you start to really develop that inner sense of compassion, of value, of worth, and yes. probably of acceptance. And I think there's a probably a uh, auxiliary benefit here that if you can see this for yourself, you can probably start to appreciate it better for others as well. Mm-hmm. That maybe if you start comparing yourself with others, then you'll stop comparing others with you or others with others. And I think this sense of diversity really does open up compassion for other people and understanding of their diversity and their difference, and maybe even wanting to help them get to that place in their lives. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It, that's beautiful. It's it's very similar. We're, we're very aligned in how we approach conversations because my favorite part of coaching, uh, which is why I stepped away from therapy because it was too, it was really structured. There were a lot of, there were just hoops to jump through and red tape and a lot of pathologizing. And so in coaching, there's this freedom and expansiveness and space. And I appreciate that you just said space, like creating space for these questions, creating space for you know, expansive, creative, imaginative answers. Uh, and then just like stepping back and the person who you're talking to knows their, their truth. They just, you know, maybe need somebody to reflect their brilliance or their radiance or ask the questions that open up that part of them that's been dormant. Cause of course they know they, their knowing is in there. So, uh, I just, uh, I can appreciate the, the questioning and whether it is from a coach or a therapist or a friend or a family member holding space for somebody to 
to imagine and explore and kind of go splunking is is yeah. so key. That's right. And that then can lead to the next phase, which is how the how then do you cope with the comparison, the pathologizing, mm -hmm. the trauma, the be trying to be in yourself in a world that is not playing nice with you in that regard. Yeah. Because that's a very real thing that somebody can say, mm -hmm. well, yes, these things are all true about me. I still have to go to work on Monday at right. the Tyson's chicken factory. And it's not cool, you know, in yeah. terms of me being myself in the world. So well, how do I deal with that? And I think mm -hmm. I think there's there's an important therapeutic model to be developed. I'm just starting to scratch the surface of this on my research with mood and food interactions and where agency exists in that. And that is that there's three major kind of uh, journeys or not journeys, but uh, junctions to this journey of developing, uh, let's say, a narrow sense of self or not being appreciated in the world or my, my diversity being challenged or misunderstood or even pathologized. And the first one is the memories that we have based on those experiences that have uh, in some way hurt us. And those memories map to our bodies in different ways. And it often, they all tend to reside somewhere in the amygdala, but they also will map themselves physically in other parts of our body. And it's the ability, and maybe this is with a therapist or a counselor, or even a, you know, in terms of peer support these days, where really good friends or people that can walk through processes with each other um, and uh, and sharing these experiences, you know, I would say that it, where, where really adverse trauma has been introduced, then definitely you want to be with a person who knows what they're doing and how to cope with that in the space yeah. that's, that's correct. But for most of us, there's a lot of memories. Like, for instance, when I was in school, I think uh, in the seventh grade, I handed in a poetry project. And I really loved this project. It was one of the few things in school that I actually, you know, rose to and did my best with. And then I got the grade back. It was an F, which oh, is a no. fail for yeah. international listeners. Um, and I went back to the teacher, you know, and I, I wasn't a good student and she knew that. And I wasn't really invested and in, in cared at all, but I really cared about this project. And when I went to the, stu the, the teacher and I said, well, why did you give me an F? She said, well, you obviously cheated. You know, this is obviously not your work. And, it, you know, back then they didn't have the Internet, so she couldn't, you know, check it in that way. But she just assumed that all of a sudden this person shows up must have been somebody else's work. Well, that affected me so negatively that I just mm -hmm. checked out for the mm -hmm. rest of my education mm -hmm. and um, basically just cheated my way through high school and, you know, went on into the world and had to learn in other ways. And I'm only now getting back to, you know, university. Um, so those those memories map to ourselves in yeah. a lot of different ways. And, and I knew I was smart as a person, but something went deeper than that yeah. and affected my ability to perform in the world and at my potential. Um, so those memories are the first thing to get to. The second one is to start to understand what's uh, our salience landscape, what our salience landscape is rather. And that means all those memories form something and i think it originates in our amygdala but it also sets our values up to these are the things that are important these are the things that are not important so right now i would assume that most of us are being and working and relating in the world according to the salience landscape and this this map has been messed with you know through those memories and those experiences some positive some negative but they that salience landscape establishes our sense of value and motivation and therefore our choices in the world now, if I can understand that through, say, identity mapping or through your podcasts and appreciating the diversity of me and, and, I, and I find friends and relationships and books and inputs in my life that's going to keep celebrating that, that salience landscape will become more and more, say, realistic, not just positive, but realistic in the sense mm -hmm. that what's true or real about me. Mm -hmm. And then that leads to the third thing, which is called relevance realizations. What's relevant in the world, therefore, for me as my identity, as who I am in the world? Not, not what's relevant in terms of what the world expects of me in terms of job outcomes or relational outcomes, sexuality or anything else, but what's relevant to me in the truth of me. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to realize or re-realize what's important and therefore choices that I might make um, to use that diversity, to celebrate it. 
um, even if I'm locked into a certain way of living right now, and that's a slow boat to turn or a large boat to turn slowly rather, maybe I start to celebrate other side projects or passion projects. Um, I love the term amateur, you know, from the French, which means to love something, you know, that you're doing, not, not, you're not, you're not good at it. You're not professional about it, but you actually love it. Oh, you know, that, so I didn't amateur, realize that. Yeah, what amateur pursuits, amour is the, uh, the root of the word, what amateur pursuits can I, you know, get into that starts to take that salience landscape and re-realizing what's important and then making choices accordingly so that I celebrate and uh, I guess it further establish that diversity of me in real time and things that I make in, th in ways that I relate and the way I mm -hmm. talk about things and mm -hmm. who I go do things with. And I yeah. think that might help to kind of you know, uh, if we're talking about neurology, the the one of the basic uh, premises of neurology is if it fires, it wires, right? So mm -hmm. if it, if it's something I'm constantly doing and thinking, eventually that'll create neural pathways that become stronger and clearer to me. And mm -hmm. that I think it won't necessarily overcome trauma necessarily, but it will start to change that salience landscape and rewire how it affects my choices. Absolutely. And when you were talking, I was also thinking about the words alignment and integrated in the sense of if we, if we are strong and are our knowing and our truth and our core values, for instance, and then we go to a place of work, you mentioned Tyson, um, you know, that doesn't feel aligned. If we know our ourselves and, and our integrity and our character, we could still uh, stay in alignment and feel integrated, even if we're unfortunately for part of the day in a place that doesn't fully uh align with us i don't know if i'm using the right words but um but but if that knowing is there then that self-compassion uh can come in even if you're faced with conflict and misalignment that's right i mean um a lot of my uh family in arkansas worked at tyson's you know so this was oh. something i've observed from <laughs> From real, the, real uh, experience. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't just trying to down the company or people who work there. Like this is part of you know my family experience. And, oh, okay. Uh, and I know that they they weren't being them their full selves there. That it was more of a social determinant. This was the company in town that they could work at, and so that's mm -hmm. the town. That's the company they went for. And I think this is true of a lot of people that the social determinants around us form infrastructure that we mostly need to comply with. But even yes. what you just said within that you can still be more of yourself than less yes. of yourself in that yes. space. And yes. that more of your spell self might improve your work environment. It might improve the company overall eventually, because my sense is that if you're playing to your strengths, you're going to be pretty good at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it might lead you to leave that company and go do something else. But um, typically we usually look at that from the outside in and think, where's the money or what might make me happier. But those are, those are, I don't know, materialistic ways of looking at the world rather than saying, who am I as a person and yeah. what might make this person happier yes. right now, today, and the things that I'm doing and how do I incrementally move more towards that? One of my favorite questions to ask my coaching clients is if you knew nobody you loved would get hurt and you knew you wouldn't get hurt, what would you do or say differently? And I usually get this like blank stare because it's impossible sometimes to think past all those surface fears and anxieties mm -hmm. about what would what would people think or what would people say or how this would inconvenience somebody or that doesn't make sense another thing i like to say is uh it, it doesn't have to make sense does it make sensation like is it sensation in your body you know t tingly or do you feel alive when you do this or when you play this uh um, right. it doesn't have to make sense it doesn't have to be logical uh, it doesn't so. um and even the ability to go to that tingly place is a it's a safety question, isn't it? For a lot of people, like, am I, do I feel safe enough to mm -hmm. feel? Because if I start feeling, then I might start to feel a number of things, mm -hmm. including the pain around me and the possibility. And that's a very risky space to be in. And I think mm -hmm. it's, again, it's a big boat that we're turning slowly. And in the identity project, one of the concepts that I mentioned is living from the inside out rather than the outside in. Now mm. we are raised to live from the outside in. Here are the expectations. Here's the curriculum. Here's how you eat your dinner. Here's all these things. And you just keep living that way and you just get programmed. So yeah. by the age of 12, you know, you've largely been moved away from that internal orientation to an external orientation. Some people hold on to it because they're tenacious. 
you know, good for them. But for most of us, we've got to kind of relearn that inside out orientation. How do I validate what's true about me, even though it might not have been validated for decades? How when the key stakeholders in my life have not spoken positive compassion into my identity, how do I arrest that and start to change that through these other processes? But I think that's the journey of adulting is to move from outside in to inside out orientations towards life. I'm writing that down. I hadn't heard that, but that that resonates. It feels it feels very true and and real and important inside out orientation. It, um, yeah, it might even be the name of the podcast. <laughs> well, you know that I, I think of how how much it how much time it takes or how difficult it is to change any aspect of our lives, and I think mm-hmm. of the the ways that we do change, and you know this ability to go. F- to appreciate what you what you're talking about and for people listening to your podcast to to appreciate diversity and to appreciate it neurologically and how that plays out in relationships or work or any number of ways or sexuality included that this is these are really important reorientation prompts for us to slowly get from one place to the next in our lives and i think if we make that the conversation you know they say that addicts um, really need to form a new identity altogether. They need new friends, new contexts, new yes. situations, because the old ones affirm the addictive you know, properties uh, that got them into trouble in the first place. And I don't mean okay. trouble in the sense that they're sick or wrong right. personally, um, but rather that the addictive behaviors or addictions of any kind, and I would say outside in living is a form of addiction, not necessarily because it's an internally driven addiction as though that's how people want to live, because I don't think this is intrinsic to our own sense of homeostasis, no. but it is, it's, it's an addictive environment that we're in where, mm. you know, how much money that job's going to pay me versus that one or hot, how hot that girl or guy is versus that one, you know, all those sort of things. There can be addictive qualities to to stay in an outside in orientation in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so to change the addictive um, behaviors, to switch identities in that sense, and not from the identity that you are to a different identity that doesn't belong to you, but I mean, coming back to your identity. Coming back, yeah. I do think it does mean the environment needs to shift. And the environment is largely internal. What am I reading, thinking, who am I, you know, but then it's also relational. Um, am I hanging around people that are constantly pushing me to live outside in? Or am I hanging around people that, you know, can I balance that? Who should be on the bus and who's not on the bus, you know, or <laughs> John, people need to get caught, kicked off the bus. And That's right. I don't mean this in a mean way, but just in a consequential, um, authoritative way where it comes back to agency, where yes. you are choosing for yourself. Mm. how what inputs you're going to get and try to get at least the dominant influences to appreciate diversity to give you that inside out orientation and then you can take that back out into the world where maybe some of those environments aren't you know perfectly aligned with that but it's okay because you you know what you're doing and you can maybe even help others move towards inside out rather than just trying to avoid that part of the world and you know sometimes that's a tricky call do i go to the thanksgiving dinner because it's just going to destroy me (laughs) You know, or is it going to be a half and half mix that, you know, maybe if I just help out in the kitchen more, which is my play, you know, just to be a little bit more in the kitchen and not so involved in other dynamics, I can be my better self in that space and live more from the inside out rather than, you know, get thrown into that other mix of expectations and arguments or whatever. And to consistently check in because that might change to to check in with yourself and say, okay, what is what are my insides telling me today? Um, Yeah. 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 This has been so it. fun. I could talk to you for a, quite a long time. Uh, and, <laughs> and so um, I thoroughly enjoy this. Is there, is there anything else that you feel uh, you want to say before we sign off or anything you want to direct? You said you were going to leave a link to, was it a mapping? Yeah. Coach? To, uh, to an identity mapping sort yeah. of thing. And by mapping, I don't mean like quantifying i mean like diversifying yeah uh, good. your sense of identity so i'll give you a link to that that you can put on the show notes um, great i guess the main thing is just to encourage people towards their own agency in this space to mm-hmm. continue that inside out journey and to do what they can to validate that space they don't need to protect it you know it just needs to be continually grown and developed like you would any good exercise regime because it's going to take some intentional effort to go from the outside in 
um, back to the inside out. So yeah, just keep listening to this podcast. Sounds like a good space. (laughs) <laughs> wonderful yeah it's like reversing the spiral uh you know going going deep in and then coming out and then going deep in and when you go back in you're going to go even deeper <laughs> it's like yeah that's right checking in. um well such a pleasure patrick uh it's fun to if to talk with you all the way over in new zealand i love this ability that we have to to connect in this way and uh, i look forward to to talking to you again thank you pasha Thank you. And if anybody would like to reach uh, you, Patrick, how, do you have a, um, a website or a social media handle? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter at Patrick K. Dodson. So okay. no, uh, no fake names there. Okay. Um, and uh, the uh, I, the identity project, you can get it off of Amazon or order it anywhere. And um, I'll I think the website that I'll send the show notes to um, has my email address as well. Okay. Fantastic. Good, good, good. And if anyone out there is uh, listening, want to reach me, I would love to hear your feedback. I would love to know what you would like to to talk about and discuss in this podcast. Um, Connecting with the audience and all the listeners is uh, very important to me. And uh, I thoroughly enjoy neuroqueering with you all. So I look forward to talking to you again. Bye. Thanks, Patrick.